This is Clayton House Entertainment X. For part two with Rick Ellis, we continue the conversation on fate, being kind and jolly, collaboration, and trying to listen with an intention that most people speak with, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy this part two with Rick Ellis. Was there a defining moment for you in um, moving on, moving along from acting to the writing, or it's just kind of life happened? Well, the defining said. moment was I was uh, I met purely by accident in a way that was so oddly by chance um, and that it seemed um, like it was uh, meant to be. Uh, uh, somebody, uh, 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 somebody named uh, Roger Rees, who um, who became the you know the my raison d'être, you know, and um, and and. Uh, he, uh, knowing him and being his partner, um, you know, for decades was a, was an, a great, uh, was a great blessing and a, a wonderful, um, you know, and is, you know, obviously the, of all the defining moments of my life, that's the defining moment mm. besides being born, um, was, was, uh, was meeting Raj and, and, um, and, uh, when we became, you know, we instantly became a couple and, uh, uh, you know, mind you, this was in 1982 when entering into a monogamous, mon monogamous relationship as a gay man turned out to be a life-saving strategy. I didn't know it at the time, of course, but you know, this was uh, this was happening with, in my life at the same time that AIDS was happening, mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, I, you know, we didn't, we never thought of it because we you know, it, it was all happening in real time, but I, I'm sure I wouldn't be here now talking to you. I would, I would have been, you know, I would have been one of the people who disappeared rather quickly, I think, um, had it not been for meeting Raj. So in, in essence, he, he say meeting him literally saved my life. He would say the same thing about me because he was a, you know, he was a guy with a drinking problem at the time. And, mm. um, and, uh, he, he, uh, gave up drink, um, uh when after we met and um uh and sort of got his life on track in some ways too so he would say that you know we saved each other i suppose but you know I, the only reason i'm still here is because of him and the only reason i am who i am is because of him he was you know uh, taught me everything and um and uh uh how to be a how to be a person how to you know how to how to be kind how to be jolly and um, and how to live my life like that, um, even when it was hard to do that. And he was also a great artist, and I'm a worker, so we were we were a good couple because I was able to sort of um, work, and that gave him the luxury of being able to um, pursue his art in in uh, in in the way that he wanted to, as opposed to having to take jobs that he didn't particularly um, have interest in. So it was a good, it was a really good symbiotic uh, relationship until, um, unfortunately, he became ill and then uh, and then died. How, how have, how have you gotten better with fate and realizing that thing, you know, things happen and maybe they happen for a purpose or maybe they don't. I don't want to project or assume, but operating through loss, but also fate. And having things come and go into a, one's life for a particular reason, you know, like saving your life. I, I'm just curious if you have any views or thoughts on that. Wow. Well, I, you know, it's a it's a big uh, uh, conversation. Um, I uh, for you know for close to 35 years, I thought. Fate was wonderful. <laughs> I thought fate was fantastic. Hmm. Fate had been so good to me. Um, I do I believe in fate? I mean, I suppose I what I believe in is that things happen randomly, that everything is accidental, hmm. and everything that seems as though it's destiny is really just a coincidence. <laughs> but I also believe, uh, because that's rational thinking. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also am irrational. I'm, a, you know, I'm not just one thing or the other, like I think probably most people. Yeah. Um, so I do believe the irrational things. I believe in, I believe in a higher power. I believe in a, I believe in destiny. I believe that, and now I believe um, actually, as Dickens did, that uh, time is a wavy curtain, and that. Uh, wherever Roger is now, uh, it doesn't seem as long as it seems to me <laughs> here on Earth, and that uh, at some time when both our courses are run, uh, you know, we'll be sitting together on a hillside somewhere again. Um, I do believe that. I I never thought about it much until he died, hmm. but um, I do think about that now a lot, <clears throat> just in the privacy of my own thoughts, and in the you know since we're <laughs> But but since you asked, I'll tell you, um, it doesn't interfere with anything. I do think that, you know, I understand loss in a way that I never did before, um, because it's different when you lose a relative um, as awful as it is, if indeed it's awful. Um, uh, it's different when you lose the person that you share your life with. It's different when, you know, you're part of a couple from a very young age and then suddenly in middle age, you find yourself um, an individual for the first time and and realize how much you really don't even know because you never even thought about those things like what color do you, do you like you know mm. or, or you know what what's what's type of food you most enjoy eating right you know the, the banality of loss is um is fascinating and often overwhelming certainly is still overwhelming to me but was overwhelming every minute of every day for a very, very long time. You know, um, and it and it strikes people differently and I don't wanna get morose about it. You know, a lot of people move on very, very quickly. I wasn't sure and still am not sure how one is supposed to move on, on necessarily without one's arms and legs. And that's really how I sort of felt about, uh, about uh, uh, Raj and, um, you know, so it's been a struggle, but it's it's been an, it's a struggle that's interesting, and and it has absolutely uh, influenced my my writing, my art, if I can call it that. I mean, is now colored by um, what it's like to try uh, to find or to keep finding uh, life after l- loss. Mm. Um, which is uh, interesting, since m- most of us will experience that. Um, and uh, and the notion that every love story is actually a sad story because every love story will will end sadly at some point or other. Mm. Somebody is going to leave first. Mm. Um, in, in you know, in, in, in absent extraordinary circumstances. Mm. Um, but and somebody's going to be left behind. And it's terrible to be the person who has to leave, and it's terrible to be the person who's left behind yeah. in com- for completely different reasons. So you know, it's 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 interesting as a as a as an artist to think about those things and try to wrestle those things as a writer is fascinating to me mm. um it's not necessarily uh a toe tapper <laughs> <laughs> but you know <laughs> but i hang out with a lot of people i hang out with a lot of people who are really really funny and um while i while i may be joy deprived now since roger died mm. i do i do laugh a lot because i know a lot of really really funny people a lot of them are writers and um, and it's great to, it's always great to laugh. I can still laugh. So, um, yeah. It, I, I personally, I just believe, you know, all good things must come to an end and that's what makes them good. And really in the end, it's just about loving and kindness. You know, I don't know. It just, to me, it's just so like, yeah. there's not a lot that matters. Just being I, I, alive. I, I never, I didn't know that. See, you're much smarter than I am, Clayton. Because no, you know, you're, you're, no, you are. You're, you're, and you're, you're way younger than I am. And, and, uh, but I remember just towards the end, Roger said, "Be kind and jolly. That's all that matters." Hmm. And he was always saying things like that to me because it seemed like, what are you talking about, kind and jolly? You know, what, what about, you know, the, what about the big things in life? And you just said your version of "be kind and jolly." That's all that matters. And it's, I think that that is the biggest thing. You know, it is, there's, mm-hmm. there's nothing bigger. Everything else, if you can manage that, everything else will fall into place. And it's, uh, it took me way too long to figure that out. But it's a good mantra. 
Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm wow. Thanks for going there. <laughs> this is moving. Um, curious if we could change topics for a moment yes. back to writing, yes, uh, collaboration with Marshall um, on a couple projects. And then the, a couple that you've worked on by yourself, uh, without diving into all of them or we can, do you have a preference on writing by yourself, uh, collaborating pluses, minuses, thoughts and views? Well, you know, I was really lucky when I, when I was offered the opportunity to work on a show about um, the music of the four seasons. I was so hip at that, at that moment. I said, oh, well, I love Vivaldi, but you know, yeah. do you really think that the whole show in that, you know, and they said, no, the guy said it was a music industry guy who had the option on the four seasons catalog. And, and he said, no, you schmuck, not the, not Vivaldi, <laughs> Frankie Pally in the four seasons. And, and I said, oh, well, why? He said, well, Mamma Mia, you know, Mamma Mia had just opened, you know, a year before. Look, Mamma Mia is a great big hit. We could do that with the, I said, but somebody's already done that. And Marshall and his wife and Roger and I had known each other socially and had become friends. And we were part of a, you know, poker night and all of that silliness. And, <laughs> and um, uh, I was by then working at, uh, as a creative consultant at, uh, at the Walt Disney Studios. And, um, and I had tried to shepherd some of Marshall's movie scripts out there. And, you know, we had flirted with the idea of doing something we both assumed would be a film. But, you know, I, I had this phone call and I called Marshall and said, do you want to have lunch with me with Frankie Valli and Bob Gordio? And he said, no. And I said, well, you know, why? And, and he said, what for? And I said, we'll write a Broadway musical about them. And he said, I've never written a Broadway musical. And I said, neither have I. So we'll, oh, but we'll only waste our, each other's time. It's not like they're going to pay us to do it. Um, you know, we're just going to do it and see if, you know, let's just see if like, you know, and that became our part time. He was doing, he was living his life and doing his thing. Mm. And I was living my life and doing my thing. And, and uh, I, our side hustle was getting together and, um, you know, after meeting um, Frankie Valley and Bob Gordio, the principal songwriter of the group um, and getting there, you know, okay, I guess to do it. Um, we, we sort of, put this thing together and then, you know, then the, you know, Gordio and Valley said, you know, what next? And I said, well, we'll take it to, we'll find a producer. Well, how do we do that? I said, don't worry. They've all been my clients, you know? So I, you know, took it around to producers, found a producer. Um, okay. Who's going to direct it? Well, how about that guy, you know, who directed me, you know, 20 years ago um, in uh, the, at the, down at the public theater, um, Des Mackinoff, I knew that he was sort of a rocker at heart, so he'd be a perfect person. Let maybe he'd be a perfect person. Plus, he runs the theater. He was artistic director at La Jolla Playhouse at the time, um, and um, and it turns out that Des, the first LP he ever bought as a kid, LP is a record hmm. that you put on a record player for your younger listeners. <laughs> a vinyl, vinyl. He bought the vinyl. Um, as a kid, the first vinyl he ever bought as a kid was Sherry and 11 other hits by the Four Seasons. Oh so God. talk about destiny. I mean, yeah. you know, in the theater, it turns out that, you know, uh, there's no formula, right? There, if there was a formula for success, everybody would follow it. But it really is an art. It's not a science. So there's no formula. Mm. And part of the art is understanding and, and c coming being at peace with at least or grasping the concept that luck has a lot to do with it and timing i think is probably the biggest part of luck can you get some can are you you know can you get the right person to be in this part can you get a theater to do your show and can is a director the director that would be the perfect director available at the time that you're ready to go can you actually deliver a script on time can you you know it, it is the is the audience going to be interested that all has to do with timing and the stars were in alignment on that show, uh, in, beginning with my collaboration with Marshall, um, who, of course, had been one of the, you know, involved in one of the great collaborations of the 20th century, right? Because he was, uh, you know, uh, Woody Allen's writing partner for years. And um, uh, so Marshall knew all about collaboration. And I had collaborated with Nancy Coyne for years and years. And so I was, I was used to being part of a team. Yeah. I enjoyed I, I love the process with Marshall and uh, and the subsequent things that we've done, um, including something that we just did last September together. 
I've also, um, you know, Marshall's a bit older than I am. Uh, I, you know, uh, opportunities came along in the aftermath of uh, Jersey Boys that were, you know, exactly the same thing, which neither of us were particularly interested in doing. Mm -hmm. And then some other opportunities that um, that I was interested in doing um, with other people or, or sometimes by myself. <clears throat> and I realized that what uh, the universe had given me uh, this at this late stage in my life, you know, because I was 45 when um, when I wrote my first show, I wasn't 20 or 25 or 30. I, you know, I had already like had several careers. And um, uh, but so it, but as a writer, I'm really just a kid. So I wanted to um, uh, change it up as much as I could. And um, uh, I'm about to go into rehearsal for uh, on a show, uh, an adaptation of uh, the novel, Sarah Gruen's novel, Water for Elephants, um, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, the producers asked me if I was would be interested. And I said, if I can do it with this theater collective, Pigpen, that's seven guys who live in Brooklyn. Um, and, um, you know, they said seven guys. I said, you know, because I, I, it, it'll, I want to experience what it's like to sort of work in a writer's room. Huh. So it won't be just me alone, because I was coming off of something where it had just been me alone in a room. Right. And um, I'm I'm doing something now. I'm writing a show with a guy who you know lives with his wife and kids in London, and that's a different sort of a challenge. I'm doing another thing with uh, where the uh, the women who are writing the music and lyrics were hired before me, uh, and that's been another sort of interesting um, experience. I just want to have as many different kinds of experiences as possible. I love collaboration. Mm. Be Why? Um, I'm writing, uh, in fact, a couple of shows with uh, with the great Bob Martin. I want to put in a plug for Bob because he's a you know he's one of those writers like Marshall, who's much much better writer than I am, uh, a really really funny writer who understands the craft uh -huh. so beautifully. I learn so much from him every time I talk to him. But we also have become great friends and we have a great time working together. And we got a couple of things on the fire now, and um, <laughs> so I collab. Collaboration, I think the theater is a collaborative form, Clayton. Yeah. You know, you can't, if I wanted to work alone, I would write a novel or I would, you know, or I would open a little storefront, uh, you know, and sell flowers. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, there are, there are all kinds of ways to live a solitary life, but in the theater, I think there is no such thing as a solitary life. And, and the goal therefore can't be a solitary life there. It's, it's, it is a purely collaborative form, whether the writer collaborates with anybody or not at some point if you get in order to get a thing on you're mm -hmm. going to be collaborating with a whole range of people so yeah. collaboration is part of the is part of the animal you know you can't separate collaboration from the theater and since the theater since what i do is really talking something into existence to begin with because the writer is generally this sui generis of the project mm. If, if you want to talk something into existence, it's a more gratifying conversation if you're having it with someone else or a, several other people, as opposed to talking to yourself. So mm -hmm. I do prefer um, the collaborative form, but even with a play like Peter and the Starcatcher, where it just says like by Rick Ellis, you know, I got to stand on the shoulders of several novels written by Dave Barry and, and uh, Ridley Pearson, you know, they're really great writers. I got to um I got to have two directors um responding to the stuff that to to the underlying material to me to begin with. And then as I started to participate in the writing process, um, you know, that they would respond. Um, and so there was that collaboration. And then there's the collaboration with the designer. So even if you're writing a play where you it seems as though you're like it's just by you. Mm. It's never just by you. Mm. By the time the audience sees it, it's a it's been a collaborative process. So uh, I think it's important distinction. Uh, everything, everything that everyone does, if you decide, if you set your cap for a career in the theater, you are you, you are um, agreeing tacitly to a life of collaboration. And I just think that's wonderful. The goal is, of course, to collaborate with people who are better than you. It's like, you want yes. to play tennis with, you want to play tennis with John McEnroe. You don't want to play tennis with somebody who sucks because then you never get, you never get better. So the goal is to collaborate with great people. And there are a lot of great people. So, um, 
you know, that's the, uh, the collaboration is not just a given, it's the excitement for me. Yeah. This uh, slight pause. You asked me if we had met before prior to recording this and throughout this conversation, the way you view life and the phrases you've used, I use regularly. So I think it's absolutely fascinating that you said that. And now it's, yeah, the parallels are interesting. That's just an observation I want to put on record recorded through all this collaboration. How have you gotten better at listening? Oh, golly. I was, I used to be such a shitty listener. Me too. When I was, when I was, um, when I started in advertising, um, you know, I was like, they thought I was extraordinary because, because I could go into a presentation and perform the things because you know I was a performer and I could sell because I was an actor and I and I and I was rangy so and I was tall and I was you know I was willing to make myself look like an idiot um you know and I thought oh man I am I am so good I am so good at this and the minute you know when I, when you're not even 25 and you think oh I'm so good at this what actually happens is you you stop listening when I, in my acting career before that, I think I was too young to understand that acting is listening. Hmm. I get that now. Uh, and that's something that I learned from Roger and his cadre of um, wonderful actors that became my friends because I was Roger's partner. Um, I, was, I was being an obnoxious, asshole in a meeting with um, American Express a million years ago in advertising. Uh, and there was an American Express account executive in the meeting. I was shooting my mouth off. I, I, it was, I'm sure I was hateful. Uh, and I was talking to people uh, in a very condescending way. This was, you know, like around mm, 1986, 87. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I was 30 years old and I thought I was, the, I was king shit. And this guy came over to me afterwards and he said, you know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a piece of advice <laughs> when you, uh, at, at least appear to listen to what other people are saying in a meeting, even if you, even if you've already decided that they're wrong, rather than doing what you do, which is immediately stop them, interrupt them and say, no, you're wrong and here's why nobody likes that guy so nobody's going to actually want to hang out with that guy and you know what you want to be in life is somebody that people would love to have lunch with not somebody who's going to you know act like the smartest person in the room doesn't matter if you are it and you're not by the way but <laughs> it doesn't matter even if you were the smartest person in the room nobody likes somebody who thinks they're the smartest person in the room at least pretend to listen but the real trick is try listening to people before speaking. This was just about the time that Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner were doing um, Search for Intelligence Signs um, in the Universe on Broadway. Hmm. And Lily and Jane had become sort of friends with uh, uh, Nancy Coyne and me because we were spending a lot of time with them. And, um, and there was a line in that play, or there is a line in that play that Jane wrote, wonderful play, with lots of great lines, you know, philosophies that would be great on a series of t-shirts um, and one of them was you should try listening with an intensity that most people only have while speaking mm -hmm. and I never appreciated that line until this guy said was saying to me basically you know you're an asshole but but you can be saved and the way to be the way to save yourself is this thing called listening um, so I did learn that Clayton a long time. He said it with such simplicity and without an edge that even though it was, I was terribly embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, I thought, okay, this is a, this is a, a teaching moment, I guess is the expression now. And then uh, something similar. I, and I learned it for a while and I think I did, I did benefit from it for a while. Then when I got to Disney, um, I had also kind of a chip on my shoulder or maybe that's the wrong phrase. But I, I would I essentially, you know, would, would walk into rooms where projects were being worked on. My and my assignment was to try to make each thing as uh, incrementally better if I could. Hmm. And uh, and that's all. And uh, after I had been there for about six weeks, 
I was called into the office of the chairman of the company. And, um, uh, and I thought, oh, well, you know, obviously I've made such a great splash here. Um, he's going to, you know, throw me a parade he, or he's going to, you know, he's going to, going to say, you know, uh, here's, here's a Ferrari or something. I mean, I, you know, uh, aren't, you're just amazing. And God, how did we ever, how did we ever do anything before you got here? And instead he said, you know, somehow there's 104,000 people who work at this company and, uh, and in, in just six weeks, you've managed to make the vast majority of them hate you because you seem to think that it's that you seem to think that um, people are uh, just trying to uh, somehow ruin your day. Let me let me explain something to you. No one sets out to make a bad movie. No one sets out to make a bad TV show. No one sets out to make a bad animated feature. No one sets out to do anything bad. And certainly no one sets out to do anything that has anything to do with you, Rick. So why don't you just get off your high horse, which ain't all that high, dude, and just try to make things better and stop with the attitude. Everyone's trying to do their best best as it happens in 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 the creative world most of the things that we do don't hit don't reach the that bar of greatness or even goodness but it, nobody sets out to do something that's shitty so stop with your assumptions and lose the attitude or get the fuck out mm. and again i was like i was mortified you know because it was so it was not at all what i expected but because he was because everything he said had the ring of truth. There was no argument. I just turned red. My eyes welled up with, you know, those, those embarrassed tears that you try not to shed until you can turn around so that they don't see you weeping as you walk out of the vast office. And, um, and the, uh, the secretary outside the door said, that must have been really hard for you. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> well, it was, yeah, it was, it was, but it was like the, it was the, it was the kick in the ass that I needed. That was the reminder of what the guy had told me, you know, 15 years before that, that had sort of, that I had sort of forgotten, which is stop thinking you're all that and just try to make something better. Hmm. And um, listening is how you do that. End of what a great sermon. What a great, what a great <laughs> answer. And now, and now, uh, and now the choir will sing. <laughs> <laughs> and the recessional will begin. No, I have, um, um, I got like two more for you here before we wrap up. I am curious, is there a common piece of incorrect advice that you hear in life or in theater or anywhere else? <laughs> uh, the check is in the mail, I guess is always, uh, <laughs> is, I suppose, hardly ever true. A <laughs> uh, common piece of advice. That might be the best answer I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, oh, if you're a writer, every and every writer who's listening now is just like, you know, is what is laughing because, of course, you know, when you're the writer, I think you, you, you're the very, very end of the list of people who get paid. Um, uh, I guess it's the. It's a st I'm a little stumped, uh, which is why I made a joke, um, sort of. Um, <laughs> you, I think that um, the the problem with advice is the good. It's the good things that you remember, and it's the bad things that you it quickly just sort of get out of your way. Hmm. But, I mean, I can, so let me tell you some. Let me tell you a really good piece of advice. Um, um, to, mm. Just to bring it back, it's a callback, as they say in writing, because we were talking about Steve Sondheim at the beginning. And something that he said to me when I was a, a kid was, you know, never, I, I always assume that, I, I, of course, not everybody is, not everybody's um, uh, not, a, not great. But I always assume that people are, don't have my best interest at heart, so that if they do, I'm pleasantly surprised as opposed to being terribly disappointed. So oh, it's a way to avoid disappointment is to 
is to manage your expectations, essentially, is what he was telling me. Mm. Not to be um, not to be overly optimistic. And the reason I mention that is because essentially at the, at the time I thought, oh, that's really, really good advice. Over the course of my life, I think it's it's sort of a cynical view of life. And um, and I've made I've actively um, because of a project that I did, you know, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, which I mentioned, excuse me, um, Peter and the Starcatcher, um, which which was a, a production born out of optimism. Uh, you know, we're literally, you know, we're going to make a play at open that closet, whatever's in that closet is what we're going to use. And if it's not in the closet, we're not going to, we're not going to bring anything else in. Um, that sort of optimism, the creative optimism, like we can make something from nothing and we can do it ourselves to what the play was saying, which was you're part of something bigger than yourself. And life is better when you're part of something bigger than yourself. Don't be an independent operator all your life. You can, you can, there's more, um, joy in being part of something larger than yourself. Hmm. Satisfaction. So I, I, I embraced in the process of writing that play and, and working on that production uh, an optimism that has um, um, filtered my life and has actually withstood the terrible you know trauma of of uh, uh, losing my husband hmm. um, to a horrible horrible disease a horrible nicest man in the world who died a horrible horrible death for no good reason other than a chromosome broke. And suddenly something started growing inside his head. And um, I mean, horrible. Mm. And yet I'm here today because I became an optimistic person. So I think um, the advice that's wrong are the advice is the, you know, it's like in the real world, this is what happens. Oh, this sort of, we protect ourselves <laughs> through this veneer of cynicism to a greater or lesser extent. But I think that the way to actually um, improve the world is to hold on with everything we've got to a sense of optimism, especially if we work in the theater, um, so that we can continue to um, try to make the world, a, repair the world, make the, you know, how are we going to repair the world if we're theater workers? That should be the goal. Mm. It may be as simple as giving them a couple of good laughs, that repairs the world. I'm not saying that everything you do has to be as significant as Angels in America or um, or um, uh, uh, Sweat or um, uh, anything uh, written by Lynn Nottage. Um, you, you know, the of course, the significant pieces speak for themselves, yeah. but every effort that we have, things that are successful, things that are failures, if the goal is just to repair the world in some way, shape, or form, give, give people a little bit of joy, mm. a different way of seeing something, change the perspective, change the perception, change their reality. Um, that's what I mean by optimism. And I think that, um, I think, uh, I think the advice that I'm skeptical of are, are, are the cynical pieces of advice and the and the advice now that I hold close to my heart are, are, are the pieces of advice that are optimistic. I love that. So I sort of skirted your, I sort of skirted your answer because, um, but, but I, but, um, and answered it in a more general way, but I think that's the best I could do. No, I, I appreciate, I appreciate the answer. So thank you. And you may have answered the next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, metaphorically speaking, if you could put a word or a phrase on a billboard for millions of people to see, does anything come to mind? This performance sold out is always a really good one <laughs> because there's nothing that makes you want to see something more than knowing that you can't get in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's of course, that's of course because I spent 20 years 20 years doing marketing, uh, you know, when, when I, I remember when I was very young in advertising, um, one of the, you know, one of the theater owners said, uh, you know, they, they used to put signs outside the theater on Wednesdays that said matinee at two, matinee today at two. And, uh, and, you know, one of the venerable old theater owners who shall go nameless um, 
uh, said, come up with a clever way of saying that. And I, you know, so I dutifully sat at my desk thinking of clever ways to say matinee today at two. And I went into Nancy with this list of things, you know, and she said, is this what you've been doing? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, there's only one clever way to say matinee today at two. Matinee today at two. <laughs> I went, oh. She said, yeah, don't make it, don't be cute. Don't be clever. Just give the audience the information they need to come to see the thing that you're trying to get them to buy a ticket to. Um, so uh, that's why I say uh, this performance <laughs> sold out always works because of course the theater like everything else is based on the laws of supply and demand. People wanna see the thing that you can't possibly get a ticket to. And um, and uh, yeah. uh, so I guess that would be the phrase. Everything else is just adjectives. You know, a good, <laughs> a good editor once said to me, do you realize how much you depend on adjectives? Try writing without adjectives. And um, he's not that the whole thing should, not that you should ever end up with something that has no adjectives, but just try it as an exercise, <clears throat> which is something I guess the journalists have to practice doing when they're in journalism school. Right. Lose the adjectives, just write what you mean, write what you're trying to say without depending on adjectives. Of course, um, you know, the billboard that you're talking about, this this, um, this uh, theoretical billboard um, that you predicated your question on is, is uh, you know, really adjectives are mostly what we see on billboards. So the I, I'm, I'm, I kind of want to be, I want to answer smarter than just say, you know, the makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck, makes you thank God for the day you were born. The things that the things that we all try to do with our shows that we all hope that somebody will say about them so that we don't have to say them ourselves. Um, those are great. But uh, the best thing to say is, uh, I have to get in, I have to get in. I'm sorry, you can't get in. But um, would you like to try again, uh, you know, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I think that's the best thing. That's a, that's a wonderful answer. Rick, this conversation, thank you for taking the time. I so appreciate you being so open with all of your answers and, and being so generous. So, well, you know, you're, you, you've asked the good questions. So I hope I haven't whinged on too long. I apologize if I have. No, you have not. Is there anything else you want to add here today before we wrap up? Uh, what's with the food prices? <laughs> <laughs> People of the world. $12 for a dozen eggs. I mean, come on already. I can't handle it. Hang in there. I would say, let's hang in there. Everybody who, uh, you know, within the sound of uh, your voice, I guess, you know, we're all like uh, theater, theater fans. And it's been rough. It's been rough um, for the theater in New York, for the um, not-for-profit theater. It's been rough for the commercial theater um, for a variety of reasons, some of which we have, we can control, um, some of which we can't. Uh, I would, I, you know, I just hope that uh, people keep coming, you know, like I, I do, um, you know, just keep coming, keep coming for that socializing experience of sitting in the dark with a thousand other people or a hundred other people uh, and, um, and all uh, experiencing something which for, you know, a couple of hours that you, something that you know isn't real, isn't true, isn't actually happening for two hours, you believe that it really is. And maybe, um, you know, you'll have something to talk about and to feel feel about um, when you leave. I think that's the that's the that's my parting shot. Keep coming. Keep coming. Um, God knows if if we didn't have to somehow, if this wasn't in our DNA, we would have stopped going a long time ago because God knows there are a lot of really good reasons to not go to the theater. But there there is this, you know, there's at least one really good reason to keep going, which is we are better for going to the theater. We're better for that socializing experience. And um, and that's the thing I think that you can only get at the live event of that sort of thing, or, at, you know, this, you know, the Super Bowl or the concert, but the theater, you know, it's here. Um, and, uh, uh, and everybody's working hard to, you know, to give you a, a good, interesting, provocative, hilarious, heartrending time. So keep participating. That would be my that would be my closing shot. People of the world, Rick Ellis. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. 
Join Clay next week for another Curiosity Conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening.